I remember growing up and having people say to me, your English is very good. I thought, well, that's great. Another question that I get often is, but where are you really from? But where, where are you really, really from? from? It's very subtle and it gets under your skin without you act, like actually knowing it. So I have um, so many friends of color who they understand what it's like to be asked where you're from, or they understand what it's like to walk into a room and be the only person of color and just how disorienting that can be. A lot of times I walk into meetings, I walk into events and I'm the only female in a group of 30. I go to so many tech events where I feel like I might be the only queer person in the room. And I go to a lot of LGBTQ focused events where I go, does anyone else here work at a startup? It's, it's subtle in the sense of not feeling like you're from the same group as the people that you're trying to do business with and how do you interface and build a connection with them. Yeah. And I think that's something that a lot of us feel like we have to overcome. And for sure, for me, it's been tough, right? Like yeah. for me, specific examples are, you know, I'll see peers of mine, other entrepreneurs who can form a more deep bond with VCs because they can go drinking with them and hang out with them and act like their family. And I feel like it's a little harder for me. There's a bit of a culture barrier and it's harder for me to transcend a relationship beyond just a business relationship because I, I, I don't come from the same world as the folks that I have to do business with. And that's tough. So there's the classic story of an automated tagging system for photos and it tagged a black user as a gorilla. Uh, and you, you hear stories of this all the time. There's voice recognition software that was developed by an all-male team and doesn't pick up female voices. There's voice recognition software that doesn't direct the camera towards women who are speaking. Uh, and without women in the room, it's impossible to test for and know that. There was another app that like can make you feel younger or more pretty or whatever. And the algorithm behind it tended to just whiten users to make them look more attractive. In the tech industry, our products uh, affect real people, lots and lots of real people. If you are at Facebook or Twitter or Shopify or Google or whatever, uh, you have millions of people who are using your products and their experiences are gonna be different from yours. They have to be. I don't even know the state of LGBTQ inclusion in the workplace. Mm -hmm. We know a few things. We know that um, lesbian and gay founders receive on average 11% less funding than their peers. Um, that's a really big problem for queer women. Uh, and that spells out to me that queer women are not getting the access to capital that we need to, to get started in this industry. We need to put an onus on the venture capitalists and the folks that invest in the venture capitalists to start saying, hey, we have an obligation as you fund companies to start being transparent about what those companies are composed of and what, where the dollars are going. Most investors are men. Uh, there's very few female investors. If you look even in Toronto, uh, which is one of the biggest spaces in Canada for, uh, for invest, uh, investing in startups, um, there's very few female VCs that I know personally. So uh, systematically, there's something, something not being done right. to give females the same opportunity as, uh, as their male counterparts to get funding. You know, we're seeing lots of conversations right now about diversity on boards. Yeah. Uh, but then we also have to push the investors to be open-minded right. uh, about these uh, new areas, new opportunities, and make sure that they are, you know, pushing their own boundaries in terms of what opportunities are interesting and, and where we should, you know, where we should fund. I, but I do think that over time we will start to see new investment groups start getting formed mm -hmm. that are focused on particular communities, just given, I think, the you know, the strength and size of some of these, you know, diverse communities. And so that will also be an evolution in our ecosystem that will also be very healthy. One of the things I've seen is that some of the biggest investors, um, people who control the most money inside tech entrepreneurship, they literally don't believe that there's an issue around diversity, right? So they believe that to a certain degree, this is a, a liberal like agenda and that, um, that that tech specifically is a meritocracy and it doesn't matter where you come from, you'll, you'll succeed as long as you're the best at writing software. Most of us know that that's not true, but a lot of the folks in power don't, like, don't fully agree that there is a problem. Something that you hear a lot is we're looking for the best candidate, so we don't have time to hire for diversity. And I think that that's the wrong way of looking at it. Hiring the best and hiring the best person and hiring the best team, which studies show are a diverse, is a diverse team, are not necessarily always opposites. 
You're not hiring in isolation. Building a team is like taking Lego blocks and trying to put them together in a way that makes the strongest structure. And if you have all blocks that are leaning one way that you just stack on top of each other, eventually that tower is gonna to fall over. How do I make sure that I am addressing the diversity issue but still hiring the best people for the job? And, and I would always say to people that, you know, when you're interviewing candidates and you have two candidates who are equally skilled but one comes from a diverse group versus the other, you as a leader need to make a choice. Will that diverse perspective help me change or improve the performance of the team uh, given that both candidates are equal? I, I don't think as a CEO you should ever sacrifice building the best possible team you need uh, in order to be successful. But in, with all things being equal, and if we know that a diverse team performs better, I think you need to sort of explore that in your hiring process, in your hiring decisions, uh, to make sure that you don't have an unconscious bias there that, that uh, is a, you know, a big, being a bit of a blind spot for you. I see both sides of the challenge around what you typically hear from tech entrepreneurs around, around meritocracy, right? On one hand, Tulip as a company, we, we would love to have our entire company represent the, like the general population, right? But it's been tough sometimes, right? Some of the graduating classes from the universities that we're hiring from don't have enough um, of a candidate pool. And so a lot of entrepreneurs will bl blame the supply and say it's not our fault. There just aren't enough of those people applying to the jobs. Um, to me, entrepreneurship is all about creative problem solving. And I think when you bring people from diverse backgrounds with different experience sets and, and different uh, perspectives of, or around how to solve problems or address issues, I think you get to more meaningful places with the problems that you're trying to solve rather than having one monolithic group of people trying to you know, solve a particular problem. I mean, I get it. Like, recruiting a diverse team is very difficult. Finding a female iOS developer, Android developer, even full stack developer in Toronto, you know, it's hard enough to find an iOS, iOS developer in general. So to find one that meets some certain criteria is very difficult for people. Um, it takes a lot of effort and energy. It takes a team that um, understands that that is an objective and a goal. Um, it also means being the kind of workplace where that sort of person, um, you know, your amazing developer that also happens to be female or also happens to be um, a minority, they're bringing diversity to their team, make your workplace a place where they don't want to leave. A lot of folks who come from like a more diverse background don't have the flexibility to take those big risks early on. And so one of the obligations of tech startups is to make their jobs more reasonable, right? Like let's have better hours and better chances at parental leave so that um, more people can apply their jobs and not have to make so many sacrifices to work. Yeah. So a really well-known example is that women will only apply to a job if they match all 10 of the requirements. Men will apply to that same job if they only have six. So if you include a long list of skills that you're looking for, suddenly the pool of applicants that you're going to get are going to skew male. Um, so, so just really paring it down to the things that are absolutely necessary for that job makes sense as a way to attract a wider pool of candidates. People often cite the pipeline problem as being one of the major issues. So there's not enough you know, girls studying math and science in high school, and so there's not enough people studying girls and women studying computer science in university, and so there's not enough women entering the workforce. And I think all of that is true. Um, we all need to do more to encourage our daughters, um, you know, our, our nieces, uh, to really pursue math and be interested in math and be interested in computers and not just playing on them and consuming technology, but also creating technology. Um, so there is definitely a lot of room. There's a lot of room to improve our university computer science uh, programs and make them more welcoming to beginners. You know, what about the person who didn't have access to a computer when they were 12 years old? But it's more than just your pipeline. It's also looking at who you choose to promote, who you choose to retain, uh, who you choose to put in leadership. Often we'll have a candidate pool for a specific role, but if there's a certain type of a certain type of job where we know that it's under indexed, we'll actually get exec executives in, in, encouraged and in, in help the, the, the uh, folks that are applying uh, move a, move along the pipeline if, if they come from a visible minority. So the strategies that we've seen certainly, I think uh, number one is composition of team and making very specific choices around how you want your teams to look. Um, and what uh, perspectives you want them to reflect as they're doing their businesses. And I think I hear more and more CEOs making specific decisions around, uh, around those hiring decisions. You know, the conversation needs to be started by the senior executive team. 
And I think that senior executive teams within organizations need to make some decisions themselves around how to build a diverse team of, of leaders and how to then flow strategies down. Consciously look at your teams, identify people who have been doing well, and give them opportunities that uh, you think are probably a stretch for them, and see what happens. I think the most important thing for CEOs in the tech industry is to address the challenge from the top down. Let's, let's change the leadership structure of these organizations and everything else will trickle down. I think every tech company in, in North America should immediately try to figure out how do we add more women and more diverse people on their boards today. We have to intentionally diversify and create inclusion around our offices. This is not something that happens by accident and people make the mistake of thinking that just naturally this will happen. A lot of leaders are so far removed from every day what's happening in their companies that they don't see the little things that happen that create these biases, that create these groups um, and separation within their teams. And if every company took the same stance when they were building their teams, if every university and college took the same stance and said, it is critical for us to make sure that there's diversity in our classroom, in our, in our workplace, on our teams, uh, we could make change happen very quickly. It's important to take a step back, look at where companies are, benchmark, and then decide to commit to making small changes. It's hard to address these challenges if we don't know the numbers behind it, what the facts are behind where the dollars are going and where the jobs are getting created. And so I, I personally believe one of the most important steps we can do is to force companies, VCs, and boards to disclose the numbers behind their companies to show what, is, what does the industry really look like right now. We won't know whether we're getting better unless we have data. So we need to measure uh, the initiatives that we're taking, the, the choices that we're making, and, and really start to understand, you know, is the diversity composition changing in our workforce, in our sector? And I think having that regular study or those regular uh, reports will help us then understand, are we getting closer or farther from having real you know, impact on the problem? There is diversity and inclusion. And I really love the, um, the metaphor that uh, diversity is getting an invitation to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance. And ultimately when you have a diverse team that experiences inclusion is when you have the strongest teams, the strongest results, and the strongest companies. Having a, having a workplace where I'm able to be out, where I'm able to share my experiences, where I'm able to talk about my partner, where my perspective as a woman is valued, is, is not just really affirming, but it also is helping me grow in my career. Because when I'm not worried about all those things, it means that I can focus on getting the job done. Which is kind of cool. We are put in circumstances where we have to be less of ourselves to feel like we fit in. I've been myself for a long time, but I wasn't in an environment that allowed me to be myself. That's a problem. I'm giving you less than 100% than I could be. Discrimination against LGBTQ employees, um, which makes employees less likely to hire and also less likely to retain and promote lesbian, gay, and bisexual and trans employees, means that both sides of the equation are missing it. You have employees, employers, who miss out on the diversity of thought that could help them get ahead, and you, employees are missing out on opportunities to contribute uh, and be part of those companies. Um, I also carry a lot of privilege and there's a lot of things that help me overcome that, um, which not necessarily everyone has. For those of us who can help, um, we really should be stepping up and using whatever privilege we all have uh, to help to diversify the group of people that are technologists so that, you know, it's not going to happen right away, but hopefully five years down the road or ten years down the road, you know, when you look at a team creating the latest AI or the latest voice recognition software, whatever it is, you feel that it represents you no matter who you are. I get a lot of questions around what should government do and how, how, do, how should they be involved in this, in this conversation. And, I, I really think for our industry and what we are trying to build, I don't think we want to rely on government to do anything. I think we have to own the problem. I think we have to step up and say, you know, our community is, is, is going to solve this problem, is going to take some, you know, initiatives and, 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 and make some decisions, um, and we have to own it. If you are someone who's in a position where you already have a lot of programming skills, why not go and try to share that knowledge with people who may not be in that position to have that access. Sometimes for, for women and for other visible minorities and underrepresented groups, we have to work harder uh, than other people do. And I try and see that as a challenge and I try and rise to that occasion. 
For me, it was the fire to make me want to be better than everybody else. Uh, I definitely couldn't have made it this far without being around other queer people and being able to lean on them when I was feeling weak and be strong for them when they were having troubles and to hear what their experiences were. Or sometimes you'll have a friend who starts their own thing and you say, you know, I'm going to support you. When you break through that barrier, you break through it for all of us. It's, it's, it's important to address it for two reasons. The first is I think it's, it's certainly aligned with the ethos of Canada and the way that we want to believe uh, uh, some of the ways that, you know, to build a strong country and to build a strong society. But ultimately, the second reason to do this, to have this conversation is because diversity is good for business results. I feel positive about how Toronto is doing. Um, the way that, for example, Ladies Learning Code has been so welcomed um, in Toronto and across Canada um, has been very amazing and inspiring to me that, you know, people are saying, yes, this is something that we care about. This is something that as companies we're willing to sponsor and support and, and you know, give space to. Um, and I'm just excited to continue to use, you know, whatever platform I've, I've built so far to continue advocating for uh, more diversity, more equitable treatment um, of women and, um, you know, every underrepresented group. So I think Mars, I think, is, is supporting a lot of diverse uh, groups and, you know, we, we are part of the conversation about getting women more engaged uh, in entrepreneurship, uh, in uh, the investor ecosystem. We also were a big supporter of Venture Out um, and had that event here and we're big champions on supporting that initiative, which we thought was fantastic and want to continue to do. We are looking at a couple of in initiatives right now around new immigrants to Canada and how to get them into the workforce. And some of these people are highly skilled technically. We're a lot further along today than we were 10 years ago. And it's not gonna take just another 10 years to get where we need to be, but we need to keep going. We all started our careers thinking tech is a place where we don't have to think about minorities because we are ourselves a minority, but it kind of flipped, right? All of a sudden now, we're, we're one of the most important people in like, driving the North American economy, right? So people like Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook are now massive parts of this new next generation job industry. And all of a sudden there's a new obligation on us saying, okay, we, we used to be the underdog, now we're actually the elite. What kind of new world and economy do we want to create? And who should be allowed inside that circle, right? Start getting those stories told, help us get those stories told, uh, and help us create more of them.